It is the Sengoku Jidai. Besieged and surrounded by his enemies, a lord pays a group of men to see his only child to safety. But do they have the skill to ensure her safety? And can they even be trusted? For this is an age of honor and treachery, of blood and valor, of gold and steel. Now available at Amazon, Smashwords, and at StudioBrainstorm.net. Links in the description. Being creatures of rage, the werewolves of Werewolf the Apocalypse are not exactly subtle with their emotions most of the time. They are also beings that it is very, very easy to piss off. And even without the whole supernatural aspect of the rage, it's not hard to see why. Theirs is a painful history, the story of fighting a losing war for thousands of years. But some losses are far more painful than others, and there have been no losses more painful in the history of the Guru Nation than the three times that one of their own was lost forever. The three lost tribes, the Bunyip, the Croatan, and the White Howlers. This video will focus on the Bunyip. The story of the Bunyip begins with the Impergium and the War of Rage. The Bunyip were among the tribes that disapproved of both the mass culling of humanity in order to stop them from causing trouble and conflict with the other changing breeds. But unlike others, say the Children of Gaia or the Stargazers, the Bunyip didn't just disagree, they decided that they wanted nothing to do with the rest of the Guru Nation and left the Old World. They weren't the only ones to do this, mind you, but where the three brothers migrated north to America across the Bering Land Bridge, the Bunyip went south, island hopping from Malaysia through Indonesia and finally arriving in Australia. Two problems confronted the Bunyip upon their initial arrival. One, there was no native wolf population in Australia. Two, they soon discovered that they were not the only changing breeds in the land down under. The Rokea, or Ware Sharks, inhabited the oceans surrounding Australia, while on the continent itself there were some Kamazots, or Ware Bats, a group of Naga, or Ware Serpents, the Ananasi, the Ware Spiders, and the Makole, in this case mostly Ware Crocodiles. Given that the Werewolves had been the ones to instigate the War of Rage, there was a very good chance that the Bunyip might not have been welcome in their new home. Luckily, the Rokea would just ignore them so long as they didn't go into the ocean, and they were successfully able to persuade the Kemazots and the Makole of their good intentions. The Bunyip were indeed one of the most peaceable of all the tribes, and certainly were eager to disavow the War of Rage and all the other nonsense their cousins back in the Old World were doing. The Naga, who essentially functioned as the ones Gaia entrusted to eliminate other shapeshifters that fell to corruption, saw common ground with the Bunyip and even revealed their existence to them. This of course got the Australian Naga in trouble with the rest of their kind because they're supposed to remain a secret even from the other shapeshifters, but that's a story for a future video. The Ananasi, on the other hand, were not so welcoming. It's never been explained why, but the Ananasi did not like the Bunyip at all, and indeed from the very beginning sought to bring about their slow demise. In the meantime though, the Bunyip were able to win enough friendship from the Makole that the great Ware Crocodiles decided to teach the Bunyip a special rite that would enable them to make up for the lack of wolf kin by breeding with the Thylacines, or Tasmanian Tigers as they're sometimes called. Basically the closest thing to wolves that Australia has, at least in terms of physiology. Humans may have lived in Australia since the 40,000s BC, but dingoes didn't arrive until at least 4,000 BC. Very little is actually known about the Bunyip, in terms of how they lived or carried out their duties to Gaia. In universe, this is because they were very, very secretive and did not share anything with outsiders when those outsiders eventually showed up. There's not even a consensus on what their tribal totem was. One source book says that it's Bunyip, and that just like some of the North American tribes, the Bunyip named themselves after their totem. 
Another source book, however, claims that their totem was Rainbow Serpent, a very commonplace creator god figure appearing in multiple different aboriginal cultures. One of the few details that is known for certain is that the Bunyip had one of the most powerful spiritual connections of all the tribes, to the point where they almost never needed a focus in order to step sideways into the Umbra. They just did it. They also had greater self-control than any other tribe, as they almost never frenzy and there are no accounts of any Bunyip Metis ever existing. Their cairns were set up so that all Bunyip could use any Bunyip cairn, regardless of what community they happened to belong to. No rituals required. Of course, the same does not apply to non-Bunyip Guru, who can't access any Bunyip cairn unless they know the proper outsider rituals, and those are few and far between. The only known aspect about the Bunyip's political culture was this event known as the Korobori, Every rare now and again, the Bunyip, along with their human and thylacine kinfolk, would gather for what is essentially a combination celebration slash council meeting. There would be music, singing, storytelling, dancing, but also serious business being discussed. The Korobori would last all night, and in the morning, the Bunyip themselves would scatter back to their respective territories, while their kinfolk might choose to remain to continue the celebration part. The Bunyip tribe had no central organization. It was merely a scattered grouping of various communities all across the continent of Australia. There was very little communication, if any, between different groups, and it was almost impossible for them to organize. Two factors that would ultimately prove fatal. But for the next tens of thousands of years, things went pretty well for the tribe. The only real problem they had were the Ananasi, who, over the many millennia, tried manipulating various aboriginal tribes into hunting the thylacines, which of course meant fewer and fewer quote, lupine kinfolk for the Bunyip tribe to breed with. As tribes like the Glasswalkers and Red Talons would later discover, although the Talons wouldn't really admit it, a balance between human and lupus kinfolk is necessary to ensure the survival of a tribe. But the Ananasi are nothing if not patient, and the decline of the Bunyip was a very slow one, likely too slow for them to notice. Certainly there are no mentions of any conflict between the Bunyip and the Ananasi, not even after they'd managed to convince the Aborigines to kill every last thylacine on the mainland. Only a small population in Tasmania would last into the 20th century. Meanwhile, the Aborigines remained a Stone Age tech-level culture no possible threat to the balance of nature in any conceivable way. But of course, Australia could not remain isolated from the rest of the world forever. The Dutch were the first outsiders, as they were the first to map the western coastline and even tried to lay claim to the land which they called New Holland, but as is typical of the Dutch, unless your name is Indonesia or Suriname, the Dutch never managed to hold on to their colonial possessions for very long. The Bunyip were perhaps a little more worried in the 1660s, when Makassar traders from the island of Sulawesi, now part of Indonesia, arrived along the northern coast looking to acquire and sell sea cucumbers, at the time a very popular and expensive delicacy in Southeast Asia. They negotiated with the northern coastal tribes for the right to harvest sea cucumbers from the local waters and even employ local tribesmen in order to help acquire them. In exchange, they gave the locals such icky weaver creations as cloth, iron knives, tobacco, and alcohol. But then, of course, came the English. First, William Dampier in 1688, and, most famously of all, James Cook in 1770. Serious colonization didn't start until 1788, but once it started, the Europeans kept coming, and the Old World Guru were not far behind them. Relations between the Bunyip and the other tribes was frosty from the start. The European Guru, of course, thought they knew better than their Australian kin, and tried to lay claim to some of the local cairns. Meanwhile, the Bunyip held themselves aloof and secretive, avoiding interaction with the newcomers whenever possible, but not hesitating to resort to violence if it came to defending their cairns. And it was in these tensions between Bunyip and the rest of the Guru that the Black Spiral Dancers saw an opportunity. A most perfidious member of that benighted tribe, Mara the Scream, 
decided to engineer a plan by which they would trick the rest of the Guru nation into wiping out the Bunyip for them, thus depriving Gaia of another tribe of servants. In the 1930s, Mara the Scream tracked down and brutally murdered Greyflank, the sister of Wyrmbaiter, the leader of Australia's Red Talon community. She made sure to leave the body somewhere and create all kinds of signs around it that would suggest that it was the Bunyip that did it. Mara knew full well that like most Red Talons, Wormbaiter was not a creature inclined to rational thought. Like most of his tribe, he was a creature of instinct and rage. To his eyes and his nose, the tracks looked like Bunyip, and the scent on his sister's corpse smelled like Bunyip. Therefore, it had to be the Bunyip and he wanted their blood. Although some advised caution, suspecting that something was up, Wormbaiter was able to persuade most of the European guru in Australia to side with him in a campaign of extermination against the Bunyip, thus beginning the War of Tears. And so the Bunyip died, one by one, community by community. They never put up a united front against Wormbaiter and his allies. To the end, they lived and fought as they had always done, in small little groups, separate and often not even communicating with one another. And so, Wormbaiter and the others picked them off one by one. The Red Talon leader himself killed the very last of the Bunyip, at which point Mara the Scream chose to reveal herself and reveal her plan, that it had all been her doing, that she had murdered Greyflank and tricked Wormbaiter into killing off his fellow werewolves, his fellow loyal servants of Gaia. Then, just to really twist the knife, she presented the rotting skull of Greyflank to her brother. Wormbaiter was nearly driven mad with shame and grief. After revealing to the other guru what had just happened, he disappeared and was never heard from again. To this day, the War of Tears remains a black mark of shame that almost all the other tribes must bear. They had allowed their suspicions and their arrogance to cloud their judgment and had done the work of the worm for it. The most notable legacy of the War of Tears is that ever since, the Australian Umbra has been especially hostile to anyone trying to step sideways, especially other Guru. The Bunyip were no more. Their aboriginal kinfolk would live on, one way or another, some even becoming kin to the other tribes, but the last thylacine would die in 1936, rendering the species completely extinct. In the early 2000s, a child of Gaia Theurge named Kernonos was able to successfully clone thylacines from DNA, and believes that he is well on his way to restoring the Bunyip, producing a small litter that underwent their first change within two years of their birth. But dark rumors surround this particular endeavor, and Kernanos may well be blinded by his optimism to a darker reality concerning his restored Bunyip. As for the rest, that's for tabletop players to decide. Special thanks to subscribers The Soul of the Dragon for voting for this on Subscribestar. See? Voting does matter, people, so join up.